All right, so it's just now 12 o'clock um, and wanting to be respectful of everyone's time. And uh, I know that uh, we've got a lot to discuss today. So I wanna go ahead and get started. Um, okay, uh, a couple of notes on logistics. First of all, um, this is our first time hosting uh, this kind of uh, virtual webinar. So I ask everyone to be patient um, and forgive us any technical glitches that may arise. We will try and deal with them. Um, we've done as much prep as we can. Um, in terms of interaction, um, there are two ways to interact. Um, and we would like all of the attendees to use the chat function to share information and links that you would like everyone to see um, for all attendees. If you have a question or comment specifically for the panel, um, we ask that you use the Q&A function. Um, and those, uh, we will watch those and Jill will moderate the Q&A uh, portion. So that would be great. Um, the purpose of today's uh, discussion is obviously not to come up with any answers because there are no definitive answers. Um, everything's changing daily. Um, uh, what we wanna do today is just to uh, talk about some of the issues that are raising concerns about the prospect of reopening uh, production, share information on a national and state uh, level about plans and different initiatives uh, that are happening and um, talk about some areas of concern. Um, we've got uh, some incredible folks both attending and uh, uh, on the panel. Um, and I'll just quickly introduce them. Uh, our, our non-Minnesota visitor today is Joe Kianisi, who is the Senior VP for Tax Business Development and Production Planning for Entertainment Partners in Los Angeles, um, where he provides production, legislative consultant, consulting, financial tax, and administrative services for production incentives worldwide. Um, he has held positions at Sony Pictures, Walt Disney, ABC, and Paramount, among other places. Um, so thank you, Joe, for being with us. Thank uh, you for including me. Charlotte Aris is joining us. Charlotte's a location manager with more than 30 years experience in agencies, both big and small. Um, and as the head of Charlotte Aris Locations in Minnesota, her clients have included Target, Best Buy, FedEx, Room and Board, and many others. Um, also joining us is Bob George. Uh, Bob is the president of the uh, Minnesota chapter of the Association of Independent Commercial Producers, AICP. Um, AICP is a membership organization representing the interests of independent companies that specialize in production and post-production of commercials and other forms of marketing messaging in the motion image. Uh, in his uh, other life, Bob is also a president at Drive Through, Minneapolis-based production and digital post house. Uh, so we will also be joined um, in a bit by Laura Ivey. Um, Laura is a producer with more than 20 years experience in film and TV, whose credits include uh, Walking Out, The Last Five Years, and Beyond a Reasonable Doubt, among many others. Um, and also on the panel here, you'll see is Jill Johansson from our office. Um, Jill will be tracking and moderating the Q&A. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, so let's, there we go. That's better. Um, so let's get started. Let's jump right in. Um, I wanna start with, um, with you, Joe, um, uh, and and really kind of the national perspective. Um, first of all, I, I've got to give uh, kudos to you and Entertainment Partners for the webinars that you've been doing over the last few weeks. They have been 
incredibly helpful. <clears throat> and uh, we'll put a link in the chat uh, to where you can find those webinars. Um, such great information. So we really appreciate that. But Thank you. Uh, Joe, do you want to just give us an overview? Because you're talking to folks all over the country, um, different state commissioners and uh, industry folks and studios. What, uh, what are some of the broad strokes, things that you're hearing that people are talking about? Sure. Well, I would probably just clarify a little bit. We're sort of waiting, uh, as, as they are as well, because um, from a production perspective, no one's really producing until the state or the governor says it's allowed, everyone's allowed to go back to work. Uh, I do know or I heard that Georgia is, is open for production. Um, and I, I just think that at the end of the day, everyone just was sort of waiting for safety procedures to, to come out. We've seen a lot of things coming from the unions and the gills and a lot of countries and even states are putting up um, their own uh, suggested guidelines. Florida put something out, a few, I think, last week. Um, I think it's uh, Europe is leading the way in terms of actually going into production in places like Iceland and, and Norway and, and South Korea. So I think we're all trying to borrow from those procedures. But you're right, we did a webinar a few weeks ago, um, which we highlighted what production on a worldwide basis might look like post COVID. And we had some international producers and there's a lot of production procedures that are already being used overseas, especially in Asia that we'll probably have to implement until we have um, we're testing and a vaccine. So we're talking, you know, based on the same things we're all reading, about well, a 12 to 18 month period before we have that sort of a surety that uh, we have a vaccine that works. Right. Now, I know you have expertise in a lot of areas, but I'm going to ask you about one that is not one of your areas of expertise, okay. but is certainly an area that everyone is concerned about. And um, I'd love to hear what you're hearing from other folks about insurance issues. I'm hearing basically what I'm reading um, in, in the trades that this is not typically a, a, a COVID is not something that's covered by insurance. Uh, there's a bit of sort of a nuance around workers comp. Again, a, a bit of a plug for ent entertainment partners. We did a really great webinar specifically on uh, workers comp and COVID. Um, again, with not a lot of answers, but at least theorizing how it should work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really highlight folks that go there. Um, the, 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 the point is, is there's so much uncertainty in terms of how this is going to work with no insurance. How does somebody go back to a set unless they sign a waiver? And will a union or a guild uh, allow their member to go back to work just on the basis of a, of a waiver? So there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty, but I, I will just say from an optimistic point of view, they are making it work outside this country and we will do the same. Going back to your original question, in the midst of the pandemic, in the, in the midst of New York City going through probably one of the toughest um, reaction to it, they approved their budget for the next fiscal year and basically extended their program another year. So that was very positive. Um, New Mexico, two or three weeks ago, as part of the governor's recovery plan, created a economic recovery team and has emphasized that film and TV production is a key element to their economic recovery, given the amount of jobs that this industry um, creates. So uh, I want to believe, and I've been saying this all along, that once we're ready to go and we have safety procedures, we'll be one of the fastest moving industries in terms of the fact that we're just that labor intensive. Right. Well, and, and that talking about incentives brings up another question, given Minnesota's lack of incentive funds right now and our lack of a tax credit incentive. Um, how important do you think incentives are going to become more important in the next 18 to 24 months or will other issues take take the front? I, I think it's going to be part of the equation. I think the, the equation before was um, I need to get an incentive in order to get my movie greenlit. And then you come up with a short list of which jurisdictions have incentives that meet those creative needs. And then you sort of then look at, you know, infrastructure and crew and how much money they have left. I think that has going to, that's going to shift a bit. I think uh, safety is going to be the first component. Uh, distance, I think it's going to be a factor, you know, given that certain folks might not want to travel on an airplane anytime soon something that's drivable by car. Um, this is just my theory. Uh, not th and then I think the, then the, the other components come into play, you know, infrastructure, crew, um, and incentives. I think, the, I think that model just shifted a little bit or will shift a little bit. 
Right. I don't think anyone's going to ignore uh, health and safety of their of their cast and crew. Right. Right. Um, and, and just one last question before mm -hmm. we bring in some of the other panelists. Um, uh, who do you see uh, in the U.S., particularly in different states? Um, obviously, we're all looking to our state government um, uh, to, uh, in terms of, of stay-at-home orders and, and work rules and that sort of thing. And um, our governor and our uh, Department of Employment and Economic Development has been great about uh, setting up uh, our kind of how things are working and creating information and helpful templates and we'll share some of those in chat. But um, obviously we have to we have to abide by state guidelines and regulations, but for the industry specifically, who is taking the lead in this? Are the unions working together? Are the unions working with studios? Um, you know, are, what are the unions, how are the unions and guilds kind of um, working on de developing these guidelines? I would say based on what I'm hearing and what I'm reading, everybody's working on this, whether it's part of a, a larger union guild studio coalition, the studios themselves, everyone is anxious to get back to work and everyone's anxious to put into procedures uh, something that will work for everyone. I, I think everyone's looking for a common practice. So, so there's no differentiation there. That's what I think I've also heard. Going back to again, where they're producing, I was just speaking to the film commissioner in Iceland yesterday morning and they have increased uh, the crew capacity to 50 uh, on set, which is, is interesting. And so we're going to be doing a little spotlight on the Nordic countries just to talk about sort of why things are different there, how are they doing things differently there, and how that could possibly be um, mimicked or utilized in other jurisdictions. Great. Great. Well, thank you. Um, and now I want to move on to uh, Bob. I want to talk to you about uh, commercial production because I, I think that um, given the, the scale uh, and, and kind of what, what Minnesota does really well, uh, commercial production will probably be one of the first things to come back. Um, so I want, it, it, can you give us an overview of what AICP is doing to prepare? Well, let me, I just posted a link to uh, a coronavirus uh, blog and it's got all kinds of useful information from the loans available to <clears throat> what to do to start up your business, uh, guidelines for a shoot um, and what you need to do. And so that gets updated as, as time goes on as we learn more because this stuff changes every day. And I'd say probably for the past six weeks, uh, the ACP membership has been getting on Zoom calls four times a week talking about all the aspects of the stuff. Um, uh, production will come back. It'll come back differently in each region of the country based on the local rules and, and stuff like that. I was talking to um, some folks out in LA who have rather large production companies and they were running test bids and they figured that it would cost them about 37,000 a day for an average live action shoot just to take care of the PPE and all the extra protocol you need to follow on set. Um, and I would imagine here, you know, it's probably three to 600 bucks a crew person locally if you want to do that. Um, so that's going to be um, a sticker shock to um, agencies and, and clients. Uh, so hopefully we move through this and find out a little bit more. And then that cost can come down because we may not need to do as much stuff. You may need to do more if you're inside versus um, on set. Um, the other thing, too, I was talking to our insurance agent who does a lot of uh, uh, insurance of production companies and post-production companies, and he told me today that um, big shoots are coming back so as soon as they, and coming back soon. And I don't know what part of the country, but, you know, hmm. they're calling him about insurance concerns, and so, you know, stuff's in the works. Um, there's a lot of pent-up stuff. Boards are pretty f much flying around everywhere. So when things can start up, they're going to hit the ground running. And if your limit is 10 people per crew, uh, obviously the non-union places will be able to uh, do that a little bit better than, than trying to do a union crew because you, I don't think you can do a 10 people shoot with a union crew. Mm. Um, there's some other issues that came up that, you know, that uh, if you make them sign a waiver, 
you, you can't, it's not going to hold up because if you're the employer and you're running a set, um, you have to do your due diligence to make it as safe as you can. And, and that they can't sign that away and then you can do whatever you want to do and they have no recourse whatsoever. So waivers for people, it's just not what our lawyers have said. It's not really legal to do. But what you can do is you can, you can take their temperature, you can test them, you can make them wear your masks, you can make them do what they need to do. And if they don't do that, you can say, well, then you don't get the job. Oh. Um, so there's, there's some laws that have shifted around a little bit. Now, on the other hand, while they're waiting in line to get their temperatures, you have to pay them. So there you go, there you get a hundred person crew coming into a studio somewhere. What's that gonna take, two hours to go through everybody? No. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it becomes really complicated and, and it's really scary for a lot of people because do we catch it in the wind blowing across the park or do I have to be within six feet of you for 15 minutes and you have to be infected for me to get enough viral load to get it? And I don't think anyone really can answer either one of them definitively. When they do, we can come up with the plan to make it safe. Right. And that's why I said at the outset that, you know, things are changing. We just, there's not enough information to be able to, um, to, to say a lot of things definitively. Um, I want to uh, move on to Charlotte uh, to ask about, um, you know, Charlotte, you have been really active here locally on social media, um, starting a Facebook page for, uh, for folks in the industry. Um, and you've been seeing a lot of, of uh, issues having to do with the just day-to-day -day economic issues for folks. Can you talk about some of the, um, some of the trends, some of the things that uh, have been affecting individuals and small businesses in uh, in the industry and possible resources that people are coming up with. Sure. Uh, well, you know, everybody's hurt. Everybody's hurting, and the uh, Facebook page that you're talking about was born out of my own frustration with trying to figure out, okay, how do I how do I apply for unemployment insurance? How do I get this PPP loan? All of, you know, and this is, th these are things that are normally in my wheelhouse, which is kind of why I'm in the field that I'm in. So I don't have to do all of that, but I figured quite quickly that I couldn't do this by myself. So it was really born out of a need to bring everybody together and get it figured out sort of as the hive collective, so the hive mind collective. So I think, you know, once that, once that page got started and people started jumping on and talking to each other, um, they were able to help themselves find the resources they needed from um, the, the uh, deed and EDL loans and the PPP. And not a lot of people have had a lot of luck with that. That PPP is really the, um, has really been tough. So, um, and then unemployment insurance too. So most of us are 1099ers and not w, we don't have W-2 income. For those of us who do, it's from those jobs that we're getting paid, you know, by Sound80 or a third, a third party vendor. But it's, you know, there isn't anybody to talk to at unemployment. And for the 1099ers, some of us have started to get the 600 into our accounts. It's just coming in automatically if you file the tax return. So people need to go to their bank accounts and actually look. But it's been really frustrating to get to get paid in any in any way, shape, or form, be it from the um, payroll protection or from unemployment, mm. it's really bad. Well, and I would urge everybody listening: if you have um, ideas, resources, please put those in the chat uh, uh, function and share so we can share those with everyone. And um, everyone, uh, uh, don't worry about having to kind of track what's in that. We will archive the chat and email that out to everyone uh, after the webinar so that you'll have all of those links that people are sharing. And Melanie, uh, I just want to highlight, again, not to make it sound like a commercial, but again, going back to the webinar series that Entertainment Partners has, there are a lot of webinars specifically regarding the federal relief. Uh, for COVID-19 in terms of different credits. So um, we've got a whole team over at EP, labor, labor lawyers and payroll tax people that really drilled down and sort of beat up that legislation and, and did a really great job 
making it simpler because it really it was not easy. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joe. It, it EP has been a great resource um, for for me as as and I've been trying to track all of this, what's happening around uh, around the country, around the world, and here in Minnesota. Um, and uh, uh, just to also let folks know that um, AFCI, which is the Film Commissioner's uh, uh, organization, uh, has started having weekly meetings and um, started some fora online for membership. So that has been, and I think will continue to be really helpful um, to be able to talk to film commissioners from other states, other jurisdictions, learn from them and share with all of you here in Minnesota what, um, what we're seeing in other states. Um, now, I wanted to uh, just give a quick update and on uh, uh, Minnesota's rebate program and then um, ask Laura Ivey uh, to join us here. Um, as many of you know, the, the very small appropriation that, min that we received from the legislature for Minnesota's rebate program um, uh, through what's the end date for our current period, uh, Jill, July 30th, 2021, correct? Yes. Um, so right. the, the funds that uh, we were appropriated for this period have all been allocated to projects current. So there currently are no funds available. Of the projects that have been certified, there are several that have not yet begun production. They've been given um, extensions by our office uh, with the blessing of the state. Um, and so we'll uh, you know, just keep in touch with those projects to um, see what happens with them. But the reason I wanted to bring Laura Ivy in is um, because Laura is working on one of those projects. Uh, Laura, hey. Um, oh. Hi. Uh, one of those projects that has been certified, um, you're in pre-production, and so I wanted you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, with right now a plan <coughs> for later this year, what are you, what are you doing? What are you preparing? How are you preparing? Um, yeah, so we're in sort of pre-pre-production at the moment where we pushed um, that we're tentatively planning to start shooting August 24th. Um, and we are crossing our fingers that we'll hold that date. I think the only thing that would make us not hold that date is the, our governor making, not allowing us to um, leave our homes, which I highly doubt at that point in time, but I also depends on how many people could be a part of our crew and could work in one uh, location. Um, and then of course, what the guilds are doing out of primarily Los Angeles, um, we would only be a SAG film so we that is going to govern i think almost 100 percent of the projects across the board um so i think that their rules will be some of the most um stringent and also the ones that are most used however i i have a feeling from what i'm reading kind of chiming in what joe said that all the yields are working together to come up with sort of a standard uh list of i think it really will be best practices there's i don't think there's a ton that one can do to to ensure that they're all doing them, but there be a lot of best practices. So some of those, so, you know, like Joe said, I've read some, some of the things from Iceland. I've read the Nordic rules. I've read New Zealand's rules that they've come out with now because they're starting back up. Um, and um, I think some of the things that we're doing um, is things that, that are not surprising that people have talked about. Um, we will require masks, everybody to wear masks. Um, probably to wear gloves. Um, we will have temperature checks. Um, and I actually don't think they'll take very long. We've purchased three of those infrared temperature guns. They're not very expensive. They're 60 bucks online. Um, we will probably break up our crew into groups of three. And I can, I've practiced on my own forehead. I've scanned it. it takes about two seconds to scan it. Uh, I've practiced on my son's forehead. <laughs> so it's very quick. Um, and, you know, that obviously, as we all know, is not perfect because that sort of catches somebody when you're you know, you have that period of latency of two to five days before a, a fever could come. Um, and so one of the things we're going to, we're potentially looking at is 
us paying for um, everybody to get an antibody test before they come just to see who potentially has them. I know there's flaws in a number of those that are out there, um, but we'll do our best on that. Um, and then, you know, Minnesota's <clears throat> testing program is ramping up greatly, which is fantastic. Um, and I'm hoping that we can, whether we pay for them or however we work on it, that we can work with the local jurisdiction. We'll be shooting up in Park Rapids that we can work with the, either a private doctor or a hospital up there to arrange for testing for our crew. And I don't know if that's every two or three days they have to go and take a test just to be sure. Um, maybe we break up the crew into groups of, th again, thirds, and this, this group goes on that day and that group goes on that day. And, and then you just cycle through just to make sure. Um, we also have the benefit of taking over a resort, uh, which was part of our plan anyway, and putting people up in, you know, cabins and stuff like that, and we will control the resort. Um, so we will be able to sort of quarantine to, to a certain degree. We are not at all of the budget. We're a small budget film. We're not at a budget where we can bring people up for two weeks early, quarantine everybody, and pay for them to be there and not start going. Um, we don't have that, um, but we can do our best prior to them getting there and while they're there with us. We're also shooting six day weeks. So, you know, we're thinking of, okay, on the, the one day off, you know, we want to corral people as much as possible to not go elsewhere, to not potentially be more exposed or, or, or putting themselves in positions to be exposed. So maybe we'll bring in food that, that day as well into our resort and just say, you know, we don't, we would prefer you don't even go out to get food if possible. You know, we're obviously not requiring it. We cannot, but we're encouraging it. So we're trying to look at all these things that will, of course, oh, we're also looking at staggered lunch hours and single serve food. No buffet catering will probably coordinate with a restaurant, which I actually think this could be beneficial to restaurants who will probably be at you know, 50% capacity. Well, we'll come in and say, great, we'll take you know, 40 meals, a breakfast and a lunch. We'll coordinate with you each day. We'll come and pick them up. You know, here's, your, here's your money. We're not taking any of your capacity away. So you still get the opportunity to, feed, to fill up your restaurant, but we'll take the food and we'll serve it to ours. So everybody in single serve, craft service and single serve portions, um staggering lunch you know trying to figure figure out like maybe camera grip and electric and hair and makeup kind of go at one time separating themselves social distancing and then they come you know come back and get to set up for the next thing while another group you know has their lunch so you know trying to be as flexible but as safe as we can um within the confines of a lower budget film great Thank you. Um, one of the things I wanted to, I, I, I do want to bring Jill in to um, uh, start pulling in some questions from attendees, but um, one of the things I want to ask all of you is um, who on set is going to be responsible for um, kind of overseeing the, the social distancing and making sure that people are being safe. Is this something that is going to be assigned to a role that already exists? Or are we looking at possibly the creation of a new position on set? Well, I think it depends on the size of your shoot. If you have a, a 40 or 50 or 100 man shoot, you're going to need one or two people probably just watching that. And, and hopefully that the, they would be able to watch that and help clean as they go, so it'd be kind of a cleaner marshal, I guess, making sure everybody stays separate. Um, and, and then like, as far as temperature checks go, I don't think you wanna hand the, the thermometer to the PA and have them do that. That most of the bigger shoots would have a medic involved so that they would be apt to, to do that. I, I agree, ideally it's the medic. Um, if, if you have one, if your shoot you know, is big enough to employ one, it makes sense. The one thing I would be concerned about though is just making sure that they're not taken away from doing what things you would otherwise want them to do. Um, you know, for us, it'll be coordinating with, um, you know, really going after the departments themselves, but also, you know, some of our, as producers, that's kind of, I think we're gonna have to oversee that a lot more than obviously we ever would in the past. Joe, what are you hearing from uh, from folks outside Minnesota on this? Um, are they how are they preparing for um, those pretty, kinds pretty of logistics? The, I mean, pretty much the same way. I mean, again, everyone's sort of trying to come up with a standard, right? Uh, so I mean, I'm not hearing anything different than what we're talking right now. Uh, what I haven't really heard is sort of one sort of 
agreed upon plan for everybody. And I'm assuming given that we're reaching mid-May that we might be hearing that soon. I mean, everyone's popping up here, you know, Norway, Florida, Iceland, everyone has their standards. But I think with he, within the U.S., whether I'm not sure who's going to do this, whether it's going to be uh, every union will have their own standards. But it'd be nice to see uh, uh, as things, it'd be nice to see things solidify a little bit. Right now, right. it's a lot, of, a lot of theory. Right, right. Well, it is, it was good to see in one of the trades um, uh, earlier this week that, that all of the union leaders are having regular calls and, and talking about all of these issues. So um, I think that's great. Um, Jill, do you want to um, uh, bring in some questions for the panelists? You're muted. Can you unmute yourself? And now I can. Thank there you. you <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, yeah. Yes, a lot of the questions that are popping up are also being answered at the same time. Um, I, I'm trying to track three different little boxes here with things running through them. Um, so there's a question here about medics and using set medics. Um, and then that goes along with the question about who would be taking temperatures on set and is it going to be a trained professional? And then to kind of wrap into that, there are questions regarding worker classification regarding oh. that as well. And so um, there are state and federal laws that require workers to be classified appropriately as either an employer or an independent contractor, but there are occasions where that is not happening or workers are being misclassified. So how are we to keep those people safe? Um, so I don't know if that's a question maybe for both Joe and Bob as AICP man over there. Um, but that's one that's come up. Um, so if you guys want to tackle that one and then I, we can move on to something else. Bob? Um, <clears throat> it, well, what do you exactly mean by, by... Well, there, I mean, this has been a, a big topic of conversation here in Minnesota in the last right. year, because um, if you recall, the legislature passed and the governor signed a, into law a wage theft law last oh, year. Oh, yeah, that. Right, right. So, and um, what, primarily what we're talking about is um, people who should be W-2 employees being classified as independent contractors. And the IRS has had rules in place for right. years yeah. um, outlining what those are. Um, and, and, but just last year, Minnesota strengthened the law. So it's now illegal in um, Minnesota to misclassify your employees. And when um, Minnesota Film and TV, when we revised our guidelines, for the rebate program, we did um, include a question about right. employee classification on the new application um, because we want to, you know, make sure that that folks are following the law. Well, I'll tell you one thing, and and I can't really speak to that locally because I don't really deal a lot in in production on a local level, mm -hmm. other than going out to VFX supervisor shoot once in a while. But on a, on a national basis, they have rules in New York and California where if AICP were to answer that, that there are no independent contractors involved on any shoots. They're all to be on payroll because that's the law. Um, so, and if they're on payroll, then you don't have to, to worry a whole bunch about that. But, you know, even from a legal standpoint, they took all the loopholes out where if you're telling them when to be somewhere, when to do something, that they are not an independent contractor and they can't do that. So the crackdowns happen there. It'll be a while before it gets here to be to that extent. But you know, now's a good time to maybe get things in the shape so that you're doing things um, proper for, for the people who are working for you. Right, and to that end, um, uh, Minnesota Film and TV, uh, we have, we're uh, restarting our first Fridays uh, in June, which we launched as a, relaunched as a toolkit series of uh, informational uh, sessions. So we'll be starting those again in June uh, in, in this kind of format. And one of the ones that we have scheduled in the future is uh, uh, sort of a primer on wage theft laws and proper classification 
with uh, representatives from the Department of Labor. So um, keep an eye on our social media and uh, uh, emails um, about when that's going to be scheduled because it's important information for everyone uh, in the industry, whether you're an employer or an employee. Um, so yeah, back to Jim. Yeah, that's that's uh, probably the people you should be talking to about the, the law of independent contractors and stuff. I'm not, I'm not the expert on that. Um, in, in the, the business, the, the editorial side that I run on, we try and run everything, you know, as, as employees and the way you're supposed to do it. So, um, there you go. Great. Okay, Jay? here's a more general question. Um, what are freelancers doing to improve or add to their skill set during this downtime to be more marketable? So, I don't know. That, that's more of a question to the crowd, I guess. Um, I don't know. I have one thing to add, but I'm almost embarrassed to say it again. But, <laughs> uh, but again, going back to Entertainment Partners, what we've done during this sort of um, uh, safe at home, we're offering a lot of free classes, uh, production accounting, budgeting, scheduling. So again, just want to sort of to answer that question, do what we can to sort of help strengthen the skill sets um, and help grow the already shortage of crew, right? We knew before this, this industry was experiencing negative unemployment in a lot of places because of the explosion of, of, of content. And um, we're all hopeful that will happen again really soon. And we're going to have to really train up a lot of folks to service the needs. So anyway, apologies for the plug, but it's, it is, <laughs> no it, it is there. Thanks. It is there. Jill, other questions? That's what I have right now for questions besides whether or not the recording of this webinar will be available later. Uh, that is the plan. Um, but uh, again, this is the first time we've done this. So <laughs> we've tested it and it worked, but um, we are going to try and do that. Um, uh, I wanted to just uh, throw out a couple of um, uh, just general pieces of information. Uh, as you probably all know, the state of Minnesota is under a stay-at-home order through May 18th. Um, so we, we don't know if that's going to end on the 18th or if the governor will extend it. Um, I just saw today that Michigan, Michigan's governor extended their stay-at-home order again. Um, uh, we do have, and, and we'll be sharing on chat, if Lou hasn't already done it, um, uh, a number of uh, links to the state uh, and particularly to DEED um, with uh, information about uh, sort of reopening and safe workspaces. And uh, one thing that I love, they, they had a template, a checklist basically for um, how to, you know, what to do when you're reopening, um, various things to think about, which um, I think we're all thinking about. Um, quickly, uh, on the legislative incentive front, um, <laughs> I, it should come as no surprise to you all that, uh, that our plans as an industry for um, uh, moving a legislative agenda this year uh, got tabled. Um, the legislature has been in Minnesota, like everywhere, hard at work on uh, COVID-19 specific uh, employment and uh, uh, economic uh, issues for people and health, obviously. Um, so this session, it, nothing is going to happen um, in Minnesota this session. Um, we are, uh, with the Minnesota Film Alliance, we will be uh, uh, pursuing the agenda we had set forth before, which was um, uh, going after a tax credit incentive for the state of Minnesota. Um, we were feeling really optimistic about our chances at the beginning of this session, um, and we hope that uh, that we have not lost momentum, that we will not lose too much momentum, um, but we will, uh, we will start working over the summer um, to start, 
you know, kind of preparing for the next session and when we might be able to start moving that tax credit agenda again. Um, so do any of our panelists have other um, things that they would like to? Sorry. Um, I, I guess the only thing I would <clears throat> maybe like to address is because, you know, we've got the editorial company too, is that <clears throat> as we move towards reopening, um, right now we've got everybody effectively working at home pretty well. We're streaming stuff out, we're controlling machines back at the office and, and uh, with the workload we have now that works just fine. And I don't really envision us going back to the office until the time comes when clients can come in because we've built the office space to entertain the clients. If the clients aren't around, there's no real reason to get the artists back into the facility. No, no, no rush anyway. So it'll be kind of a, a slow process, probably over a month or two, or maybe even longer before everybody's back in the office doing what we normally do. So that'll give us time to kind of work out the bugs, to figure out social distancing, you know, the people who are braver will be in there first. And when they see no one gets sick for a couple of weeks, a couple more will come in, a couple more weeks go by and the numbers go down of new infections in the state and more people will come back. And, and, and I want to do it so that everybody's comfortable in coming back into the creative space. And I know we all dearly miss being with each other and, and throwing things back and forth and, and editing at home isn't the same as editing with your clients, you know, because that's a, uh, Working in the rooms about 80% of what you do as an editor or an artist. And if you can't do that, it's really hard to do that over Zoom from your house while your kids are wanting help with uh, math homework. Yeah. Yeah. So so how are things in the in the post production world right now in Minnesota? What are you seeing? Um I think everybody has some projects they're working on. We have some long-term things that continue to go so that keeps a lot of the effects guys busy. Um, edits have dropped off a little bit, but everybody's had some during this time and that's good. We've uh, gotten our PPP loan so that adds a little little buffer to things. We've not laid anybody off and, and I, I don't want to, you know, because we're supposed to keep everybody paid so we can keep, keep the world moving. So we're do, doing our best to make that happen and, and we have so far. Mm -hmm. um, when we get on these national calls, you've got people in New York and LA, big houses where when this thing first happened, they couldn't pay their rent the next month. Um, they have, some of them have no projects and they've had no projects and they're trying to maintain their employees and pay the rent in Manhattan and their employees, if they got to take the train from Brooklyn into Manhattan and go up the elevator 20 stories and go on an edit and then come back home and go see their family, they're terrified. They don't know how they're even going to get back to the office again. So that's, that's a huge issue. Um, LA, it's a little different. You can drive to the, the place. So it's a little different dynamic there than, than Manhattan. Um, but they're going to have a, a big lag in getting back to work because they need the big productions to happen to drive their business. Up here in the Midwest, our business is more not so much being with the big production companies, but working with the agencies and working with client directs. And so that creates a different kind of work for us. And I think folks I've talked to in town, everybody's got some stuff going on and I believe everybody's gotten their PPP loan. So I think they'll be, they'll be good. Um, so we're, everybody's open and working as far as I know, unless someone has something else to say. Jill, are there uh, questions yes. coming in? Yeah. Yes. Um, going back, hopping back a little bit to incentives. Somebody asked, has there been any, thought to approaching the legislature about a tax incentive specifically for post and animation only, since those are socially distanced already and can quickly jump into that type of work. Well, well Melody, I know you and I have talked about a lot of different things that Minnesota could do to sort of uh, enhance uh, production and those types of production are, are very long term, highly mm -hmm. skilled and high paying. Um, so I can only talk theoretically. That's a great idea. <laughs> uh, legislatively, I, I, I can't speak to that, but uh, I will say, you know, without sounding too much like I'm standing on a soapbox, no matter what people think at the end of the day, incentives um, create jobs, maintain jobs, support infrastructure and grow infrastructure. You just look at places like, everyone looks at Georgia, right? And they say, look how busy Georgia is. But, uh, you know, 
2006, it wasn't that busy. And it, it really wasn't that, and 2006 wasn't that long ago. It's a long, it's, it's also, I have to say for those who are listening, an it's a long game. You can't put an incentive in place and expect in eight months or a year that everyone's gonna shift their, their, their decision. Producers look for and programs that have longevity uh, supported by government. And they feel, especially TV, they're not gonna bring TV somewhere, set up a show, and then all of a sudden the incentive goes away. Um, I will say based on what I'm reading, this is not proprietary information that I think that the foreign territories are gonna make a hard push and really bump up their incentives to bring production back because of the fact that it creates jobs, maintains jobs and the ripple effect throughout the, their entire e economy. Yeah, and can I add that I, I, I think I've mentioned this to Melody a couple times too. Um, I think it would be potentially useful and I've no, I haven't talked to the legislat legislators at all so I know none of this is easy, um, but like New York did, I, um, you know, when New York had 25% for production, but 30% for post, um, I did numerous projects in New York where I only brought post there. Um, and I think that Minnesota leaving it all equal um, doesn't, it doesn't encourage some productions that are not, wouldn't be based here anyway, to think about doing post here. And so if you give them an extra incentive to do so, um, I think a lot of people look at that. Um, because it is a very good uh, post-production base. So we just need to let more people know that and incentivize them more to do it. Yeah, no, those are those are great points. And um, since we're basically, you know, going to be starting fresh in the next session, that is absolutely something that we will look at. And I think that given uh, our administration and, and our deed commissioners, um, emphasis on uh, tech uh, that that we can make a very good case for uh, animation and post-production um, being within that sort of high-tech uh, uh, world that they are are very supportive of so yeah Jill and we have an animation talk coming up actually the first Friday in June that's right so our our friends uh mike owens and alicia reese are going to be joining us that's the first friday in june i think it's the fifth or the sixth check your calendars and watch our social but they'll be coming in to talk about um animation and what's going on in the animation world in minnesota mm -hmm. yeah i mean it seems like animation is is going to be a, a good bet for uh for the near future um in terms of new content so yeah other questions i would, oh, I would also say visual, visual effects as well i would just again i'm not a producer so i look i'm looking at you laura uh, if you can't go to somewhere overseas are you going to try to create that you know with a green screen i i, I just i'm just as a layman, I'm thinking, yeah, why would I risk anything if I can create it virtually? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's going to be big. I also think the sort of the, the LED rooms, you know, shooting in those sorts of environments like the, the Mandalorian did are becoming bigger and bigger as well, where you can make, you know, sort of backgrounds completely while you're shooting it there. It's not just a green screen you're looking at. So I think right. all those things are going to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think everybody's going to have to adjust a little bit. Even on my small project, we've had to we're looking at, we had two crowd scenes and we're looking at what does that look like in today's world? Luckily, most of our film is um, two characters primarily. Um, so our, and we're shooting outside for a lot of it. So our film is sort of made for a post COVID world. <laughs> Little did we know, um, <laughs> but you are going to have to sort of adjust and figure out like, okay, I'm not gonna get a hundred people together. Um, do I do this digitally? Do I shoot it in a creative way? Or do I just change the scene itself? Um, and just kind of get that story beat in a different scene. Um, so, you know, everybody's looking at all those, all, all kinds of ways to be different now. Yeah, and uh, along the, the lines of just looking at um, different uh, possibilities, I, one of the things that I've been thinking about and, and talking to some folks here uh, in Minnesota is, uh, uh, in terms of um, space, uh, particularly soundstage space, um, what can we do to potentially repurpose spaces that are 
uh, in the near term, probably going to be going unused for a while. Um, uh, large venues um, like convention centers or sporting uh, arenas or or you know performance venues that um, where it's it's not likely that you're going to have large crowds of people gathering and and those those things might be um, sort of among the last to start up. Well, can the industry step in and uh, make use of some of those spaces? Um, so just a, a random thought. Jill? Yeah, I have kind of a long question here. There's a, um, I'm trying to condense it down for you, but um, <laughs> hopping back to COVID and onset precautions. Um, there's discussions of medics to handle temp checks and things like that. But are there thoughts regarding the many other additional guidelines currently being discussed industry-wide in regards to sanitation and distancing? Um, and the uh, something that should be required by perhaps an outside vendor. And does anybody have thoughts on those additional needs? Pre-vaccine. I mean, I'm not sure that, <clears throat> I'm not, I mean, I know we're in a different world than we were before, of course, um, and it's a tremendously sort of scary um, people who are, you know, immune suppressive and whatever have a higher risk and that sort of thing. But I, I do think in the past we have relied positively and negatively on the crew um, and the powers that be within the crew to maintain safety already. Um, I, I can already tell you for our film, uh, we have the amazing Carrie Bush as our first AD, and we've had numerous conversations, by the way, even sort of before this, when we, because we're going to be around on the lake and in water. Um, so talking about, you know, safety in that and set medics when we had that around. So that was already a conversation we were having. Um, we've also had several conversations with her, you know, even since then, social distancing, masks, splitting up the crew, um, you know, how do we try to maintain new safety standards in the system that we have. I have a, my concern by putting outside people is on smaller budgets, my concern is cost. Um, anything like that is gonna set people back um, and not be able to move forward. And um, we're already bit dealing with potential costs of um, uh, you know, the masks, the gloves, the extra testing, the temperatures, you know, the delays as, as Bob said in time to just do all of that you know, releasing the crew early, potentially to go get tested each day. So just figuring out those sorts of things um, are already going to be extra cost on our budget. Um, but of course, ones that we will do so we can move forward. So, I mean, I think that, and that I now see, is there a conflict of interest? I think that safety has is always existed this way on film sets. There's nothing different about COVID safety versus just in general safety on a film set. Um, so, you know, we've operated that way. And I'm not saying it's the most perfect way but it has operated that way for 10, you know, tens of years. And I think that um, that is most likely the way it will continue with guidelines set in by the guilds, which is what they do now. Um, so that's my thinking of what, what will that will be and what, it, what potentially it could be. Bigger sets, great. You know, giant movies, you can, they have a lot more flexibility, but if you're talking movies in the, the million or less, particularly even in the 5 million, um, you know, it, it becomes an issue of cost and not necessarily the issue of being safe. So Laura, there's another question that popped in that may relate to that then. Um, what happens if a crew member shows up to set with a fever? Are they getting paid if they're sent home? How, how does that work? We haven't gotten into that. <laughs> um, you know, we haven't, I mean, as Joe, I know one of the first questions of the, of the program was about insurance. Um, and I think, I think my personal feeling is that COVID potentially will be covered. Um, I don't know how you do a $150 million movie and not cover it some way. Um, but I think it, even if it is covered, it will be cross prohibitive for a lot of independent movies. Um, and so I think the question is, how do we operate in, in this world? Um, and I think you try to do as many safety precautions as you can um, for the for number one for the safety of the cast and crew. Number two, as a, as a part of being safe, hopefully nobody gets sick. But if you do, what does that look like? And I think it depends. I mean, yes, ideally, in an ideal world, you shut down for two weeks. 
everything's, you know, put away and you go and you come back. Um, you know, what does that look like for a million dollar movie, a $5 million movie, a hundred million dollar movie? Um, you know, there's so many moving parts, you know, we all know you delay two weeks, you lose your cast. Um, I'm not saying these are like, you don't do it. I'm saying these are all the implications that you have. Um, and um, so not only, even if you shut down and didn't pay anybody for two weeks, which nobody would want, but even if you did, that's not ideal because everybody has something else to go to. Everybody's schedules are right next to each other. Um, so I think that there's so many things that haven't been discussed and I don't know how you can discuss everything. I mean, I'm a lawyer as well. And lawyers are always like these, these people who are trying to think of everything and put them down in a contract. And there's no way you can think of everything. You know, you try to, you think of the worst case, but the, something worse than the worst case can always happen, unfortunately. One of the things we've discussed uh, with the ASCP uh, membership is the fact that the insurance companies are not gonna write any COVID-19 insurance. And matter of fact, all the new policies that will come out will exempt it. Um, when it comes to an employee on set, uh, if you, you know, if they have a temp, you have, you send them home. Now, whether they get paid or not, I think depends on if the unions are going to negotiate that in. Um, you know, I think that'll work its way out as this, as we move forward through some of the stuff, as far as a, um, you know, shutting it down because someone had a temperature there for a day shoot or something. I, I don't think there's anyone who's going to be able to pay for that. So I think that somehow the shoot will go on as long as everybody's being as safe as they can. If you have all the safety protocol in place, according to OSHA and, and all the people out there who say what to do, um, you're doing your due diligence to keep it as safe as you can. If someone contracts the virus on set, how do you know they got it on set? How do you know they didn't get it getting gas on the way to the set? There is absolutely no way to prove that that person got COVID-19 on that set unless you've sequestered the whole cast for a month. Yeah, I, I, I agree things, with that completely. Those are and some I, of the things we talk about. There's just so much that we don't know, and we will learn an awful lot as we tiptoe back into this thing gently to see what's working, what's not working, what is absolutely ridiculous that I'm sure will, um, hold on, that is absolutely ridiculous that, that you know, you know it makes no sense. You know, like three pairs of gloves or something, you know, there'll be stuff like that, but we have to work through it to get to the point that we get back to what is going to be kind of the, the normal of what we need to do to stay safe. And, and I think everybody's aware of it and it'll, it'll happen quite naturally. I, I, I would agree with that hundred percent. You, you don't know unless you literally control everybody for every moment. Um, and I don't know that that's what anybody wants. Um, I also think people keep talking about waivers and are you signing away everything and does, what does that mean? And can people, can companies sort of act more worse because you've signed a waiver or whatever? And it's like, no, a waiver does never, I mean, legally speaking, you can never waive negligence anyway. It doesn't matter what the waiver says, you cannot waive certain things. It's just by law, you're not allowed to. So, I mean, I think people are, I think what we're all talking about though is what is that individual's pers that person's comfort level. And that still remains. Like you you know, you want to take a job, you love the project, but if you're not comfortable with the crew, the 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 safety that they've put in place, then don't, you probably shouldn't take that job and somebody else may be comfortable. That's not to say that the the precautions they've put in place are not good or they're un, you know, they're they're not good enough or whatever. That just is your safety. As long as I think I agree, Bob, that you go with the guidelines of the guild or OSHA or whomever is setting these sort of standard guidelines that we all need to follow, you can always increase them. Um, but as long as you are comfortable with that, it comes, comes down to just your personal comfort. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I know this is so elementary, but can I just say at this point, if you are as, as an employee, as, as a independent contractor, as a, a, a freelancer, please, please, please don't go to work without a contract, um, some kind of written agreement. Um, it, it's, that is something that our office hears about far too often. Um, and it's always, uh, in response to a bad situation, 
Um, but if you don't have an, a written agreement, um, there's, there's really nothing that can be done. So, I mean, that's COVID aside, always have an agreement. So, um, Jill, I think we've got time for maybe just one more question. Um, if you have another I don't, quick, somebody type one. Well, then I want to just put to um, uh, all of the panelists, um, just uh, if anybody has any thoughts that they want to leave everyone with. Um, I, again, as I said at the top, there are no answers right now, but um, I, I think that we are all trying to work through this and, and I hope that we can keep communication open, um, continue having these meetings, these conversations, um, and reach out to each other um, and, and rely on, on everyone as we move forward. Um, Joe, Laura, Bob. So I just wanna say um, thanks for everybody for hopping on today. It's really great to see everybody's name up there, and it seems like it's been like a year since we, we've seen everybody or, or had contact, and I think this is great, and I hope everybody's well, and that we can all get back to the way we want to work uh, in the next couple of months, I hope. Agreed. Yeah, and, I, and I, I totally agree with that, and, and hopefully my movie is going to go on the 24th, and hopefully there's a bunch of people on the chat and names that will be part of our production and hopefully we can can fulfill all of our safety thoughts and requirements and make everybody comfortable and we can make a great movie. And then, Millet, I'll just say, and I've said this to you before, especially now when productions might not travel, uh, try to promote not just what Minnesota is, but what it can be yes. on film or television because sometimes people have a preset notion of what it is and obviously this is the magic of filmmaking and television so it could be anything so um you know i encourage you to get in front of producers who need everything that you guys have mm -hmm. and can like i said that can be uh, used to replicate another location that they might not be able to get to yes absolutely thank you joe um we are gonna do that and charlotte thank you uh any last words no just everybody stay safe continue doing what you're doing we're all we're all trying to figure out our, our new protocols. Keep at it, keep at it. All right, Jill, thank you. Um, thank you all for being a part of this. Um, uh, look for communication from our office about uh, our upcoming First Friday toolkit series and uh, other potential meetings. If um, uh, you have ideas, please feel free to share them with me. Um, uh, suggestions for future um, webinars. Um, we will be emailing the text of the chat out to everyone. I see that popping up as a question. So, um, and, and we may be making the recording available. We'll see how our technical <laughs> skills are and if we can make that happen. Um, so thank you all for joining us and stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.